Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Now, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus this morning. Do, do you remember when you were in darkness? Do you remember how hopeless your days were, your future was? Well, if you can, just take a moment and allow yourself to abide in Jesus, to be washed in the radiance of his glory, and to stand in the light and in his truth. Feel the hope of tomorrow and the blessings of today. And with a song of proclamation, Lift your hands and sing unto the Lord your God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And what a joy and privilege to be in his family, to be chosen by his hand, and to be taught by his spirit. And we are taught, friends, through his word, through the Holy Bible, as we read and obey, he opens our eyes to truth. He illuminates our soul and he gives us the opportunity to be changed forever through the power of his word. Well, with that being said, today we are continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. We want to spend a few more moments in these three verses before we move on. So let us read them again, Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. It is Jesus whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now yesterday we spoke about Jesus being the heir of all things. Today I want to focus on the final four aspects that we see in this verse. We are told at the end of verse 2, Jesus has made the worlds. Now, as we read yesterday in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For by Jesus all things were created, things that are in heaven, things that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Now, the first thing we want to notice in this text, if you were to look up the word worlds in the Greek, normally it's cosmos, meaning the material world. But in this context, it's the word ionis. Now, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but that's okay. What it means in the Greek is ages. In other words, it's not just the material world, but it's time, it's energy, it's matter, it's space. And so all the smallest details, all the intricacies of life, all has been created by Jesus and is being sustained by his power. And everything works together so uniquely, so profoundly that if one thing were to go awry, everything would be in chaos. And yet Jesus has created everything with a specific purpose in mind. How foolish are those who tell us that this all happened by accident, when as we begin to understand how it works as a well-oiled machine, there is absolute no possibility that it happened coincidentally. Whether it's space, whether it's time, whether it's energy, whether it's matter, whether it's the human body with all its complexities, Animal life, sea life, the fowl of the air, the vegetation, oxygen, the laws of nature, the laws of gravity. Everything has been so perfectly created and refined to work together. And Jesus is the creator of all. 
We're told in verse 3, he is the brightness of the glory of God. Now picture it like this. God would be the sun, S-U-N. And Jesus is the brightness that radiates from the sun. The brightness of the sun isn't the sun, S-U-N, but without the sun, there would be no brightness. And without the brightness, there would be no sun. And so they work together in perfect harmony, bringing light, warmth, and comfort to all of creation. And so Jesus is the brightness of the glory of of the Almighty God, of the Father. He is the express image of His person. If you were to take a rubber stamp and stamp an envelope, the exact image of what's left on that envelope is what that rubber stamp is. God the Father is the rubber stamp. The image on the envelope is the Lord Jesus. And so He is the exact representation of of the Father. If you want to know the Father, look to Jesus. Read the Gospels. Read the story of Jesus. The Father is everything that Jesus is, and Jesus is everything the Father is. That's why Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me, because if you see me, you have seen the Father. Next, we are told that Jesus, in his wonder and omniscience, upholds all things by the word of his power. In order to better understand this, let me take again from John MacArthur's commentary on the Hebrew letter as he reminds us of the importance of all things being held together. He says that we base our lives on the continuance, the constancy of laws. When something such as an earthquake comes along and disrupts the normal condition or operation of things even a little, the consequences are often disastrous. Consider, for example, what instant destruction would happen if the Earth's rotation slowed down even a little. The sun has a surface temperature of 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit, we are told. If it were any closer to us, we would burn up. If it were any further away, we would freeze. It has been set at the perfect point in space so that we can survive here upon the earth. Any closer we would burn up, any further we would freeze. Our globe is tilted on an exact angle of 23 degrees, providing us with four seasons. If it were not so tilted, vapors from the oceans would move north and south and develop into monstrous continents of ice. If the moon did not retain its exact distance from the earth, the ocean tides would inundate the land completely twice a day. After the first flooding, of course, the others would not matter as far as we'd be concerned because the devastation would be global and we would be eliminated as the human race. If the ocean floors were merely a few feet deeper than they are, the carbon dioxide and oxygen balance of the Earth's atmosphere would be completely upset, and no animal or plant life could exist. If the atmosphere did not remain at its present density, but thinned out even a little, many of the meteors which now harmlessly burn up when they hit the atmosphere would constantly bombard us. We would have to live underground or in meteor-proof buildings. Things do not happen in our universe by accident. They did not happen that way in the beginning. They are not going to happen that way in the end. And they are not happening that way now. Jesus Christ is sustaining the universe. He is upholding all things in perfect harmony and in perfect unity. Scientists who discover great and amazing truths are doing nothing but discovering a few of the laws that Jesus Christ designed and uses to control the world. Now that's an interesting statement because basically what he is saying is that we have this idea that science is leading us. But according to our text this morning, friends, that's not true. Science is merely catching up what Jesus has done and known all along. There are many things that are in the Bible that have been misunderstood for centuries. 
And as science makes its new discoveries, many scientists are becoming believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and the authenticity of the Word of God because they are learning that many of the things that they are just now discovering has been written through the timeless pages of scriptures for thousands of years. Men think themselves to be so wise, and yet they are mere fools. And so just as Jesus is keeping everything in perfect harmony and eliminating any chance of chaos in the world that we live, so, friends, it is only through a life in Jesus that we remain in perfect harmony and peace. Outside of a life of Jesus, everything is absolute chaos. Next, we are told in our text that he himself purged our sins and he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Did you know that there is not a single seat, not a single place to sit in the temple? And the reason for this is that the work was never done. The priests were always busy occupying themselves with the things of God for the forgiveness of their sins and then the forgiveness of the people's sins, for their sacrifices and then the people's sacrifices. Yet we are told here that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. No longer do we have to go daily into the temple and offer sacrifice for our sin. Jesus, once and for all, became the great sacrifice for our sin. And he said, it is finished. I can sit at the right hand of the majesty on high because the work is complete. Sin is conquered. And that's what Paul is trying to explain to us in Romans chapter 6. If you haven't read it in a very long time, go read it, friend. Because if you sin, you only have yourself to blame. Because Jesus has conquered sin. It's dead and in the grave. And we are to live no longer therein. Hallelujah. We don't have to listen to the lie of the enemy. We no longer are in subjection. We no longer are slaves to sin. We have been set free. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. And that has nothing to do with the outer things, with the material things of this world. It has to do with a, with a spirit of joy and praise and peace and trust that lies within us, that enables us to live victoriously through Jesus. And just as our text tells us that Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, so too, friends, should we be the brightness of the glory of Jesus. Jesus would be the sun, S-U-N, and we are to be the radiance of that sun the light of the world. And we are to be the express image of Jesus. Just as that rubber stamp leaves this exact impression on that envelope, we are to be the exact impression on this world of the Lord Jesus. Some have said it this way, you might be the only Jesus people ever see. You might be the only Bible they ever read. And so it's not time for us to relax and sit back. There is much work to be done through disciplining our flesh, through living holy lives, through crucifying ourselves daily, through doing the things that honor God and the things that honor men. All men, no prejudices, treating everyone with the love of God just as Jesus did when he was here on the earth. Oh, friends, I trust that you have seen through these last several days the splendor, the glory that lies within these passages. Jesus being the brightness of the glory of the Father, the express image of his person, upholds all things by the word of his power. And he alone purged our sins, sitting down at the right hand of the majesty on high, where he now intercedes on your behalf, my behalf, to the Father, asking spiritual blessing upon our lives. Friends, are you growing in the knowledge, in the wisdom, and in the truth of the Lord Jesus every day? Are you saying together 
with John the Baptist. I must decrease. He must increase. He must be the center of my life. And everything must be focused upon him and around him. Are you taking every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Jesus Christ? Oh, friends, I trust that you are because it is only then you will know true inner peace, true inner joy, and you will radiate his beauty as you walk through this dark and evil world. I love you, friends. I'm so grateful that you're again with us today. I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to sit together and be blessed by the reading and the study of the Word of God. I'm thankful that your lessons in the Spirit don't end at the end of these videos, but that He walks with you and that He talks with you and He exhorts you to a higher life that only comes through absolute surrender to Jesus, your King. Oh, serve Him faithfully, friends. Love Him deeply and honor Him in all you think, say, and do. Now, as he wills and until tomorrow, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.